This paragraph is taken from a chapter subsection entitled, Who Are You and Who Could You Be? An unforgettable story captures the essence of humanity and distills, communicates, and clarifies it, bringing what we are and what we should be into focus. It speaks to us, motivating the attention that inspires imitation. We learn to see and act in the manner of the heroes of the stories that captivate us. These stories call to capacities that lie deep within our nature, but might still never develop without that call. We are dormant adventurers, lovers, leaders, artists, and rebels, but need to discover that we are all those things by seeing the reflection of such patterns in dramatic and literary form. That is part of being a creature that is part nature and part culture. An unforgettable story advances our capacity to understand our behavior beyond habit and expectation toward an imaginative and then verbalized understanding. Okay, these are just some research Such I got a story from presents the, uh, us in the most compelling manner with the ultimate um, adventure, Miguel, the divine channel. romance, and the eternal and battle between good and evil. All this stuff. helps us clarify our understanding of moral and immoral attitude, personal and social. This can be seen everywhere. And always. Question. Who are you? Or at least, who could you be? Answer. Part of the eternal force that constantly confronts the terrible unknown, voluntarily. Part of the eternal force that transcends naivety and becomes dangerous enough in a controlled manner to understand evil and beard it in its lair. And part of the eternal force that faces chaos and turns it into productive order or the takes order that has become too restrictive, reduces it to chaos, and renders it productive once again. And all of this, being very difficult to understand consciously, but vital to our survival, is transmitted in the form of the stories that we cannot help but attend to. And it is in this manner that we come to apprehend what is of value, what we should aim at, and what we could be. So chapter two is um, yeah. imagine who you could be and then aim single-mindedly at that. And, and for me, after being on tour with you, um, I think that's something that, that got into me through osmosis, that I would be on stage. And even though everyone was there for you, I thought, hey, I'm part of this somehow. This, this thing, somehow I became part of this. And then once I realized that when the PA announcer said my name, that those people knew me, I thought, that I'm me. I'm, I'm the guy they're talking about. Like I'm doing something. And then it that just that it helped my aim. It helped my aim. And I wonder how many people just don't they don't know how to aim because they have no experience like that. Something like that. Well, that's that's part of what tradition is supposed to teach you by presenting you with examples of great people of the past. The lesson is not supposed to be exactly bow down and worship these people. Mm -hmm. It's be like them, be like them, and you could be. And I mean, that's really the goal of the humanities when it's the humanities. If it's not, if that's the goal, then students will study the humanities. As soon as that ceases to be the goal, then it, it, there's, there's nothing of value there. I mean, great literature tells you, it tells you the great story of good and evil, always. It's good and evil against a background of chaos and order, always. And the evil characters are there to, to, to be bad examples and the good characters are there to be good examples. Or you see the interplay of those forces within a single person. And, 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 and it's a reminder of, of who you could be. And you, you can find out who you should be. It's actually, this, and this is something quite mysterious, I believe. And, and part of the proof, let's say, that we exist in a world of value. Your conscience tells you who you should be. Now, that doesn't mean that necessarily that it's infallible, but people wrestle with their conscience. You know, there isn't anyone, I've never met anyone who is, you know, a, I'm not, I'm, narcissists accepted, yeah, let's say. Yeah. People are generally tormented by their conscience. And the reason for that is that they're not, they're deviating from the path that is their destiny. I mean, and if you don't think that, well, then what do you think? What do you think that conscience is? I mean, I've asked my classes repeatedly, do you have a little voice in your head that tells you when you've done something wrong or you're about to or a feeling? And they all 
they all immediately agree with that. No one finds that a foreign concept. And so if you don't know who you are, your conscience will remind you when you're not, sorry, if you don't know who you could be, your conscience will remind you when you deviate. And then you can start to attend to that. Think, well, look, I'm actually ashamed when I do Mm -hmm. this. I should stop. Unless I want to be ashamed all the time, it looks like I should stop. And then maybe you stop doing that, and and then your conscience objects to something else, and maybe you stop doing that. And as that happens, you start to develop a vision of who you could be. And the chapter indicates it, 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 uh, it looks at symbolic representations. It's an examination of a certain symbolic representation of the ideal. And so it's my attempt to... Um, assess tradition for what it can tell us about what the ideal human being might be like. And the ideal human being is the person who forthrightly upholds the traditions of the culture and forges a way into the unknown. We, we went through that and, um, and pulls new information in and builds, rebuilds himself and the world. And that's who you could be. And now the, 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 the difficulty comes in figuring out how to do that within the confines of your own life. So in some sense, that's how to bring the divine to earth. Mm-hmm. There's this divine pattern, but it's, it's general. See, this is one of the mysterious things about Christianity that's so remarkable about it is that there's, there's, an, there's the, 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 the Christ that's eternal, the word of God, say. So that's, that's a representation of something absolutely transcendent, but it's married to the particulars of one particular time and space. And obviously, um, critics of Christianity regard that as one of its major flaws. You know, that there's this idea of God who is a carpenter in some out-of-the-way place, in some out-of-the-way time. But you're someone in an out-of-the-way place at a particular time and place. And for, for you, what that means is that for you to make contact with the highest of values, you have to bring that down to your particulars and figure out how you do that. It's going to be a way that no one else does it because you're the only one that's you. And, but you can, you can aim at something, aim at something. And the, the, the point of the chapter is that you aim at something and that will shape you as you move towards it. And then your aim will change, you'll move. But that doesn't matter. It gets you going. And you'll be molded across time more and more into the person you could be. Can, can you talk about that just from a personal perspective as someone that I've seen do it? I mean, I, 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 that's what I saw you do every night. You would take your, your intellectual um, curiosity to, to the end of where it would go. Sometimes you would get off stage and, and say to me, oh, you know, I, I took that as far as I could tonight. And then the next night you would go a little bit further with it or a little bit further. And I knew there were moments because we did so many shows. I knew when you were a little past where you would want to go and then I could see you come back. But can you talk about what that was like for you in terms of your life, how you felt, how time felt, how the relationship with the audience felt when, when you're, well, when you're doing with, it right? Because I feel like people well, don't know that when you're doing it right. What does it feel like? Well, to begin with. And this happened when I was in graduate school. I had a lot of bad habits. I smoked like a pack of cigarettes a day and I drank a lot. I I came from this little town in northern Alberta. And like many little towns, especially in northern Canada, alcohol overuse is de rigueur. You know, it's it's. And so um, I noticed when I was in my early 20s that the only time I really regretted what I had done was when I was drinking. Now, it was also interfering with me writing because I couldn't concentrate well enough if I was hungover, but I also couldn't really concentrate. I couldn't couldn't tolerate the emotional strain of what I was writing about when I was hungover. It was too... I couldn't handle being on the edge because I destabilized my nervous system. In any case, I stopped drinking. And the reason for that was, well... I decided I didn't want to be ashamed of what I was doing anymore. It seemed, I thought, well, maybe I could not do things that were shameful and then see what my life was like. So that, that was sort of on the negative end, the constraint end. Um, I think people get, on the more positive end, people get deeply involved in what they're doing. 
if they're in the right place in the right time. So that you, I would say you can tell this is the idea of heaven on earth to some degree. When time stops, when you're not aware of the duration of time, when you're so engaged with what you're doing that you're not aware of the duration of time, then, then you've got the forces of chaos balance and order balanced properly. It's, you're not stultified and bored. That's an excess of order. Everything's too predictable. And you're not overwhelmed. You're, you're dealing with, it's like, it's like it's, you're playing tennis at the peak of your game. That's partly what people experience when they're great athletes, when they play. The zone, yeah. You know, and they're always stretching themselves to their limit. You can tell that if you watch a gymnast, for example, who, who has a brilliant performance. They've stretched themselves beyond their domain of competence during the performance. And that's what makes everybody leap to their feet. That's, that's the incarnation given embodiment right there in front of you for some moments. And everyone cheers that on. Do you think it's weird how it becomes a fleeting moment in a way? Like, I, kn I know, I know what you're saying is true. When I'm, when I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm on my game and, and my thoughts are, are right and straight, time just moves. And then I go, whoa, a month passed. A month passed, and I was good that whole time, and I, I did right that whole time, and I was happier, and my relationship with David or whoever else is, is better in that time. But that, that it becomes fleeting, in that suddenly you could have a great month, and then suddenly something happens, chaos returns. Like, it's, it's that we almost forget that moment. You can't, like, you can't hold it. Well, it requires a lot of... It requires even, to some degree, some good fortune to maintain. I certainly haven't been able to do that while I was ill. You know, and time, one of the consequences of, of my illness, whatever it was or is, was time dilation. Like, days lasted weeks, it seemed like. Minutes lasted hours, and I mean that literally. Um, and that was terrible, the weight of time. It's the weight of brute mortality. It's the weight of self-consciousness. And you escape that immersed properly. So... And that, that second chapter is a pretty practical chapter. It's like, well, if you're not who you want to be, then think about how you could be better. Take a chance, aim at that, work at it, and see what happens. So, so that's a, and that, that's a disciplinary routine, I would say. Yeah, and I, it takes you out of your current order. One of the sections of your book that I really loved, it was chapter two, where you get into alchemy and you get into, you know, a discussion of... Uh, it was one of the richest chapters for me. And Helen you, Lewis said I sounded like a stoned undergraduate. <laughs> I, well, I must so like stoned undergraduate. It was so interesting, eh? Because this is, she, she wrote this review in The Atlantic. Um, and I was talking about... Sorry, I'll let you get back to this right away. But sure. she was talking about... I commented on this uh, the snitch in Harry Potter. Because I found that it's a very old symbol. That's a really old symbol. It shocked me to death that she used it. I couldn't believe she used it because it's really obscure, this symbol. And so I talk about it in the book. And, she, you know, that's what she dismissed as the ravings of a, of a, you know, stoned undergraduate. But then I thought, well, look, Rowling is richer than the queen. <laughs> she came from nothing. She produced this empire. It's an absolute empire. Books that's, uh, that were 600 pages long that she could read to children in stadiums. A whole string of movies that dominated the entertainment landscape for like six years. It was a, uh, it was a, cultural a global cultural phenomenon. It's like, well, don't you think that's worth looking into? That's what makes you a stoned undergraduate? It's, or are you so clueless that you can't see that when something like that happens, there's a mystery. It's why in the world would the story of a magical orphan become a multi-billion dollar, decades long, global cultural phenomenon? Well, if you're interested in culture, if you're interested in anything besides narrow politics, you'd think that that would be a, you'd think that would be worthy of investigation. It's not easy to see these things sometimes for the mystery that they are. No doubt. So, and I think it's anyway. what you say about stories. Stories can be true stories. The story of Harry Potter and the Snitch is a true story because it's in resonance with a real idea, something that's in the collective consciousness, something that's 
in our primordial psyche in a way. And so when we hear it, well, otherwise it would be collective. Exactly. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't all enjoy it. And look, we can go to those movies. We suspend disbelief willingly, instantly. And we get immersed in the story. That's magic. That's magic. What's going on? It's worthy of investigation. Yeah. So anyways, I, I, I sort of sidetracked that. Well, that's actually exactly where I was going. So okay. I'm going to read, okay. read this section. And you're talking about the snitch as the uh, alchemical symbol of the round chaos. And you say this. The seeker is the person who is playing the game that everyone else is playing and who is a disciplined expert at that game but who is also playing an additional higher order game, the pursuit of what is of primary significance. The snitch, like the round chaos, can therefore be considered the container of that primary significance. So for those of us who don't know the Harry Potter movie, there's a game called Quidditch, and it's basically like lacrosse, and you try to get the ball in the goal, but there's a seeker who actually is seeking this magical golden orb, which has alchemical kind of roots and in the round chaos. And if they seek that, the game is over. And it's been given that, you know, additional, as you say, primary significance. And this concept was really, really interesting to me to have it unpacked because I didn't, I watched some Harry Potter and I saw it and I saw the game. That, of course, didn't occur to me. It was just like, oh, this is the rules to this game. But then I realized in my own life, there's the game that I'm playing. Oh, I'm running on it and I'm doing these things. But what is my snitch? What is my round chaos? What is that ultimate higher order potential that I'm seeking. And so my question was, have you thought about for you? Because we can obviously see the game being played as far as the normal Quidditch game. But for you personally, what is your what is your snitch? What is your round chaos that you're seeking the game within the game that you're playing at large? Well, what's always attracted my attention predominantly. So, so let me unpack some things here. Is sure. that, um, <coughs> some some of the interpretation of that symbol, a lot of it came from my reading of Jung, because he's the only person that I've ever read who seems to know about such things, even knows that they exist. Jung believed that you, your interest, which is a relatively involuntary phenomenon, right? You get interested in things, but but you can't make yourself interested in something. The interest grabs you and and grasps your attention. And so Jung thought of that as a deeply seated biological mechanism, which it obviously is. It's a neurological mechanism of some sort that governs, it possesses, it, it has the capacity to possess your voluntary attention. Just like hunger does. When, when you get hungry, you're typing away, writing a book or something, and you get hungry, hunger starts to grab your attention. Well, look, you're interested in some things and you're not interested in others. Well, why? Well, some of that has to do with your choice, but, but not that much. A lot of it has to do with who you are in the deepest sense. And Jung believed that you were likely to become interested in things that furthered your development, furthered your psychological development, made you more and more competent. So, for example, you might get interested, you might really come to admire someone, and so what they do grabs your interest. And that happens with children quite a lot. And they get interested in kids who are slightly ahead of them in the developmental curve. And then they mimic them. And so you're, the interest is something that grabs you to move you forward on the developmental curve. And so it's, it's, the, it's the manifestation of your potential higher self in the present. And Jung described that as the self. The self was, in his view, the totality of your being. It's not definable. It includes you in the future. And you are, you are, in some sense, something that's coming to be into the future. Uh, hopefully to be more than you are. Although, you know, not always, because we also degenerate. In any case, your interest pulls you along on a particular developmental pathway. I've always been gripped, in some sense, by things that are very, very dark. Um, and the, most of what's by pathology of, of one sort or another, which is, of course, partly why I'm a clinical psychologist, you know, but mm -hmm. I wanted to remediate it. I wanted to help. But, but it, was, it was the compulsion to investigate the darkest of darkness. And whether that's been good for me or not, well, that's a, that's a, that's a different question. I suppose it has been extremely good in some ways, and it's been, it's been complicated. We could certainly say that. But, but then more, I, I wanted to figure out what, what, 
what would protect us from, from that darkness. And I guess it was because I was so shocked, existentially shocked, when I first encountered the writings that pertain to the Holocaust and to other genocidal acts of that sort. And I was always interested in that for some reason from a psychological perspective. It's like, what compelled people to do that? And how can we not do it again? And that, so, so anyways, anything that, that focused on that grabbed my interest. That's why I read Jung uh, extensively and Nietzsche and Dostoevsky and Solzhenitsyn. Those are the people I ran across, others as well, that, who seemed to have some answers as far as I could tell. And um, so that's what it's been for me. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, and I don't know why. It might be my proclivity towards depression. I really have no idea. You know, I'm, I'm a creative person by temperament, and I also have this depressive illness. Maybe it's the consequence of those two. I don't know. Who knows, right? Who knows what 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 pulls you forward? The ancients, the ancients would typically externalize these forces, you mm. know, when they couldn't understand it. And you talk about that with the god Mercury. The god Mercury was yeah. the one that drew you to these different things. But yeah, the Greek got, he's got wings and he flitters, and it's that's what your attention does. It pulls. It's like in Up, that uh, that Pixar movie. Every yeah. time there's a squirrel, the dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's their snitch. They, that, that's yeah. the grip of instinctual forces. It's very comical, but but it's it, and see in human beings, I think it's unbelievably sophisticated because I do believe that we're compelled to follow a line that leads to our further development, and I do think that that involves mimicry of the hero, for example. Um, and the hero, psychologically speaking, is that figure which represents. A, a, a potential stage of development for you. And you'll find your hero because you'll admire something or mm. someone. And why is that? Well, something's, well, I gave you the best explanation for that that I can. That's, that's the future you, in some sense, manifesting itself in the present, saying, here's where you could go. Yeah. And that's Another. the instinct for growth. Another aspect that they externalized was the idea of the daemon which is almost like the, uh, the mercurial impulse that's taken and stretched out for a long time. It's something that's continually drawing you towards mm -hmm. some potential realization of what you're capable of. And they put that again in, in this kind of demigod landscape. But of course, that was just their way of understanding things. Well, Although, but it, it also makes a tremendous amount of sense. Like sure. To, to make, to make um, rage a god like Mars... Well, yes. Why? Well, it's immortal. I mean, rage will be here long after you're gone. <laughs> you're definitely its pawn at times. You know, it's not obvious who's in control when you're enraged. Yeah. In fact, at, at some levels of rage, that can even be a legal defense because we recognize that you can be out of your head. Your normal personality isn't in control. And really powerful motivational forces have that transcendent reality it's not a, and it, rage is older than human beings it's really really old and it, it can have you in its grip sexual impulses the same way hunger all of these things are are unbelievably powerful forces and they don't just operate on the primordial level as far as i'm concerned there there are sophisticated gods of motivation and we we are um, possessed by them when we do such things as go to movies. We don't notice. Is what the hell are we doing watching this movie? Why are we entertained by it? Why does it grip our interest? We don't know. We don't even question it. It's like, well, it's entertaining. It's fun. It's interesting. If it's interesting, you don't have to justify it. <laughs> then you think, right? Well, that's, so, that's interesting True. in and of itself. If it's interesting, you don't justify it. And then someone can tap you on the head and say, look what you're doing. And you think, Oh, yeah, that's kind of odd that I'm doing that. What the hell am I doing standing in line for three days to see Star Wars when I'm an atheistic engineer? Right. What's going on here? Oh, look at that. It's a, it's a religious impulse. Yeah. And, and I don't have a religion, and so this is filling the gap, and that's why I go to Star Wars conventions, and, and it, I'm possessed by something that I haven't pursued. Hmm. One of the things that you wrote was really powerful for me to read because to me, I think it described my snitch, my round chaos, that thing that I'm seeking underneath 
the games that I'm playing. And so I'm going to read this little snippet here. Who could you be? You could be all that a man or woman might be. You could be the newest avatar in your own unique manner of the great ancestral heroes of the past. What is the upper limit to that? We do not know. Our religious structures hint at it. How would someone who determined to take full responsibility for the tragedy and malevolence of the world manifest itself? The ultimate question of man is not who we are, but who we could be. That's it for me. I mean, for me, I read that. I was like, yep, that's it. There's the snitch with its wings and its golden, you know, mercurious allure that I'm that I've, I'm really chasing underneath all of this. And I enjoy all these other things. But who could but you be? Exactly. You see that in children. I watched little children play and what, what they're doing, you know, they're 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 attempting to grow forward, but they toy with with identities. I'm, I'm a, my, my little granddaughter, I wrote about her in this book too. It's so funny watching her. She, she had Pocahontas, the Disney movie, and she had a Pocahontas doll. And she watched that movie a number of times. And then for, well, it's been a year now. She's only three and a half for a whole year. She has two names, Scarlett and Ellie. Um, and uh, one's her middle name, but, but she's called one or the other. And, and is, seems to be perfectly comfortable with both. Um, if you ask her if she's Ellie, she'll say yes. And if you ask her if she's Scarlet, she'll say yes. But if you ask her if she's Pocahontas, she'll also say yes. And then if you ask her if she is Scarlet, Ellie, or Pocahontas, she'll say she's Pocahontas. And she's been, she's been insisting on that for a whole <coughs> year. And so she's playing. The only thing about what you're about to say, though, is that if we're going to give up, why give up our imaginations and, and let them rule the way rather than reality. And that's what, it, that's what we've done. We, we've given up reality in favor of using the imagination. And the reality is much cooler than the imagination. The reality really is really cool. I mean, I, I'm trying to show it to you, and if, I don't know why no one's seeing it yet. Um, <laughs> but it's really way better than anything we could elon musk or any of this computer garbage that we're doing or any way cooler than any of that who they could be you know it's the play is in fact the 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 exercising of that realm of possibilities and so a good father a good parent for that matter but i think this i think at least is an archetypally paternal role puts a border of security around the child, you know, and the mother might be inside that border of security when she has young children and play can take place there. And the play is the investigation of multiple identities with the hope of like finding one that is functional and that is also socially desired. Looks like possible those things body can't be dissociated. Right here, one of the reasons I think that the identity the fate, politics the has right bothered here. me so much, speaking of arm, snitches, you know, arm. it's bothered me. It's like, this bothers me. Or and arm. I've only recently realized that some of it had to do with what hmm. I saw as limitations on free speech, which is I have to say the words that, you know, some authority or some population demands that I say, which I don't like. Um, but there's something else, too, which is that it's based on a very misleading theory of identity. Your identity is not just who, how you feel about yourself at this moment. And you can't impose that on other people because they don't know how to deal with that. Like, even if they wanted to, they I would see all the faces game. within faces, but I'm to trying to see if we got body people. imagery and so here. And it almost looked like we think do. Think of identity as something that's negotiated with other people. And so if you, if you have an implicit theory of identity, that like face. the one that seems to be increasingly dominating... The cultural this landscape, face right here. which is I, identity, I, I know something mouth. that's only subjectively determined something and can also change and from moment to moment, then Goes you're misleading people as they develop because they come up with body, a very unsophisticated arm, notion of what identity and arm, is. And that's not chest, good because it, <laughs> that's a belly, that's core. And I, groin a part area. of your identity is your value to other people. That's a huge part of it. And that's not subjective. That's Other hmm. people make that decision. Yeah. So, and you, and you talk about that in, uh, I think it's chapter three, where you say that's one of the ways we keep our sanity is 
talking to other people and the interaction with our community and and all of these other things that isolate <laughs> us like more than part of a leg here. to a single yeah. subjective Let's perspective see. is going to lead to a certain madness. It, you know, it is definitely de well that, exactly well. I tried to impress upon some of the trans activists that were after me when I first made some public statements. I said, look, I don't think I didn't say it this eloquently. Unfortunately, I said, mm. what I what I, what I there. would have liked to have said now at least was. It isn't obvious to me at all that your theory of identity is you know, going to serve right the there. function that you assume it is. Yeah, it looks like it's not psychologically like sophisticated enough. It's not sociologically a sophisticated a enough. You can't area. insist that other people play a game that they don't know how to play, especially when you also don't know how to play it, except to say that it exists. So, hmm. and this sanity issue is. You know, a lot of us is externalized because we're such social creatures and everyone has weaknesses. You know, you're going to de degenerate hmm. along your weakest to watch it. axis. And if you're fort and you won't be able to control yourself because some of your weakness will be precisely that inability to control yourself on that axis. Like maybe, maybe you have a biological predisposition to alcoholism and, you know, you have three shots of vodka in 20 minutes and you're like on top of the world. You know, um, there are people like that. They often have extensive family histories of alcoholism. It's a biological uh, phenomenon. Uh, you can tell if you're like that if it's really difficult for you to stop drinking once you start. It's a real warning sign. and means alcohol is a great drug for you, subjectively speaking. But, you know, hopefully when you drink too much, other people are going to start telling you. It's like, no, you're... And that's actually how you start diagnosing alcohol abuse. Are you getting in trouble with the law? Is it interfering with your intimate relationships? Is it interfering with your ability to hold a job? It means that the, the addictive substance is starting to dominate your life in a, in a manner that's counterproductive. And other people are there to ensure that you stay balanced enough so that you don't deteriorate entirely. You're lucky if you have that. And the, part of the point I make in that chapter, and I would say in both books and in Maps of Meaning as well, is that the primary obligation of a parent is to serve as a proxy for the social and the natural world. But let's say the social world. Why? Well, because you want to train your child to be not only acceptable socially, but highly desirable socially. And the reason for that is that by the time they're about three, three to four is the transition period, they're going to be spending more time being socialized by their peers than by you. And that will increasingly be the case as they develop. And if you haven't made them, if you haven't encouraged them through judicious attention to be socially desirable, they're going to be rejected by their peers. And then they fall farther and farther behind on the developmental trajectory. Jordan, you asked the Times person uh, in the full-length article or full-length recording, which I listened to, you said, hey, don't focus on my illness in this. Focus on why people resonate with my message, which she, of course, did not. Uh, but that leaves... No one does. Uh, leaves me an opening. That, I'm going to take so it right now. It's so, so interesting to see that, is that... It's so interesting because, you know, the only time that ever gets addressed is by, by the mainstream media. Jesus, you know, horrible cliche, but... It's usually sort of brushed off, and it's usually, well, he seems to be attractive towards young men who are troubled. Well, first of all, that's not so bad, is it? I mean, hypothetically, the most ardent feminist is primarily concerned with helping the troubled young man not be so troubled. But it's brushed off in a cynical sort of way, and it, it, the cynicism is also disbelief that that could possibly be serious. A serious enterprise. Well, I think it's a serious enterprise. Why do you it's think they resonate serious. with you? I think it's because who knows the final answer to anything, you know, but I took what I learned about what happened in the Second World War seriously. It's like, wow, we can be really bad. We should do something about that. Like that was unacceptable. We're even worse right well, now, Well, was it or Jordan. not? Well, how We're unacceptable? Right was now. it change your Who's life unacceptable? It? Better be. 
if you want it not to happen again. And it's not like it, the next time it happens will make the previous time look like a picnic. Yep, it sure does. We're way more powerful than we were. Mm -hmm. More than you know. You know, when we're getting to the point, this is something Jung talked about, especially near the end of his life. We're getting so powerful that each individual is now a force of almost unimaginable destructive power if they so choose to be. And that's just going to, that power is going to continue to increase. And what that means is that the degree to which each of us has our act together is going to be something upon which the world increasingly depends for its maintenance. I'm going to add something to why I think people resonate with you so much. Um, in the book, you encourage people to think from an evolutionary perspective, which I think is incredibly important. And I think what you offer people is, one, you make we all struggle with our own internal demons, and you allow people to see how that's a heroic endeavor, maybe the ultimate heroic endeavor to conquer that inside of yourself. And then going back to the beginning of identity being a function of behavior by helping people begin to identify as the hero, engaging in relatively straightforward behaviors like cleaning your room or like in the new book, making an area beautiful, um, refusing to give into resentment, aim at one thing, which fuck was one of my favorite parts of the book and see how extraordinarily good you can get at that. Like when I think you know, about some... that's a good thing is you got to aim at something. It's like otherwise your life is meaningless. Well, what should you aim at? Well, I don't know. Well, pick something. Pick something. Aim at it. As you move toward it, you'll get wiser. Then maybe your aim will change. That's okay. But at least it'll change in an informed way. It's like discipline yourself in one dimension. See what happens. Well, that's exciting. And I think that's something that's open for everyone. You can do that. I shouldn't say that because I don't believe that. I think you can find yourself in a situation that's so dire that you don't, there's no escape from it. But that doesn't matter because this still, this is, the hero myth might not be, the best we have might not always work. <coughs> but it's still the best we have. And the fact that it might not work doesn't mean we should throw it away. It's still the best we have. I have something better. I mean, everyone dies, and so we fail in some sense. It. The fact that a symphony ends doesn't mean that it wasn't worth listening to. Yeah. When you put that in an evolutionary context and you acknowledge that people are compelled by biology to strive. They're compelled by biology to progress. They're compelled by biology to um, be courageous, that they will be rewarded for being courageous neurochemically. They will be punished for being a coward neurochemically. And Yeah, well, think about, you know, the thing about that biological explanation, too, is that we've been social for a very long time. We've been social for so long that our social nature is programmed into our biology. Mm -hmm. And so you'll be punished if you're not useful to other people. Yes. Mm -hmm. By your conscience, because you're a social creature. Mm -hmm. And the question is, well, how could you be most... Here's another question that starts to what verge on the religious. What does the most useful person look like? Well, who is everyone hoping they'll meet? And that's a genuine question. Like, and that's the ideal. The ideal is the person everyone's hoping they'll meet. That's Christ in, in the Christian culture, psychologically speaking, independent of any religious claims. So that's, these, these, these this is, this is, I suppose the essential. That's because what they did was they took away the creator and the true creator and our knowledge of them, which is really all around us. They took away that and gave us what was called God and prophets. Prophets were actually human beings. We crossed them over, some we considered human, some we considered uh, enlightened or whatever, a uh, higher spirit or whatever. Um, but that, they're just representations of humans, and that's what they were. And uh, then we were, when we were ready to get rid of those religions, went over to science and math and medicine and 
when we went over to these new religions, then they knew that they had to change it again. They knew they had to do this. So this, it's exactly what they're doing. It's all playing out. So in other words, you go from, uh, if you want to get them away from God and prophets, then you now have to convince them all that the uh, gods and the prophets were fake and then space aliens and the outer space and the science and math is all real. You have to teach them all that. And, and the math could be real. Take out zero, take out infinity, and the math could be real. But right now it's not. Um, and true and whatever. So now you bring them into nationalism. Now we, we go to nationalism. That's how you get them out of it. So in other words, over the last uh, 700, 800 years, maybe 1,000 years, um, more and more countries all, you know, played off of that. But we know that a lot of these were not playing nationalism when the Indians were, let's say here, are the natives of, of all the lands. The Native Americas, the Native Australia, uh, Native um, Africa, you know, all the Native lands before they all were all mixed up, you know, because we all crossed over and took over a lot of uh, other lands. Not just the white man, but the white man was running the show. It's all purposeful. Alright, let's do this. Well, I don't know. But the answer isn't obviously no. In rule two, you say to imagine who we could be and then to aim single-mindedly at that. But reality gets in the way of you reaching that potential and it can hurt. How can people cope with the pain of unreached potential? <coughs> well, part of... Oh, that's a really good question. Look, every ideal is a judge, right? So you posit an ideal and instantly you're in inferior position in relationship to that ideal and that can be crushing. Okay, so what do you do about that? Well, one answer is no ideals. Well, that's not a good answer because then you don't have anything to do, right? So... so and that deprives you of a main source of pleasure, which is observed, uh, generated as a consequence of observed movement towards a valued goal. So if you have a high goal and you see any... Yeah, but majority of people's goal today is to get likes on their, on their thing, you know? The more likes they get, you, you know, when you first hit the internet, you might have experienced it. And then, you know, you seem mature enough to have gotten over something like that mighty quickly, but... There are a lot of people who don't. Uh, it's almost like posting their photos and stuff, you know, all over Facebook and everything, their family photo, taking a picture with your lunch, taking a, uh, photos and videos of you eating and doing everyday things. It's so ridiculous. You know, the the the, uh, the, the woman with the drink in her hand and her legs folded by the pool showing that she's having a uh, pina colada. Okay, like you know, anyone gives a shit. And we all do this. And then everybody hits like on there. And every time you get that like, it's exactly what you're talking about here. So just what I like and a like button, people can either be down in the dumps or feel on top of the world just because someone likes or dislikes them. Uh, just to click. It doesn't even, they don't even know them. But yet they click like or dislike. And in the Facebook case, they know them. So even then, isn't that bad to do that to people? Should people really be egging on their family members and their friends to post ridiculous shit like that? Or should they come out and say, stop posting fucking pictures of your legs crossing with your bike with that wine in the middle and stop post? I mean, but then you can't because then it gets offensive. Oh, why are you posting your kids every day, you know? Well, I'll tell you what, uh, that's the Native Indians had that right too because we should not be... Uh, post on our faces like this all over the place. It's it's our God given image that that we're given, uh, and it's really not that rare uh, because everybody has, you know, I don't know, I never counted how many twins, but we all have a lot of twins. Um, I can tell you that just from watching the true creators work. Even like I said, there is no such thing as infinity. You can count the images. 
So when you get up in the trillions and trillions and trillions and you start realizing, but there are tiny little differences, you know, so uh, an ear might be a little different or uh, his hair might be a little bit different, but still, for the most part, that image looks like millions of other images that I looked at that looked very familiar to it. So when I say twins, eh, not exact twins, because there is no math in the true creator's work. And that's more evidence that there's no math in the true creator's work. Because it, nothing's like that. It's not nothing's divided evenly. Let's say you know if you look at one side of a face to the other side of the face, it's not divided evenly. That doesn't happen until you get to the false creator slash creator's work, which we can see that just look in the mirror, look at your animal, look at your pet, and you see how evenly everything is divided. Did I hit play? Yeah, I did. One sentence about who you are right now while you're sitting here and sometimes they can do that right away or sometimes they can't and then you you make a microanalysis of that and what you do is you you reduce the magnitude of the move forward until you hit the point where you actually will do it and that's like the secret to good negotiation and as well if you're negotiating with your wife maybe you want one of her behaviors to change and then obviously she has to be on board with that and hypothetically that's going to be reciprocal process but what you want to do is find a small improvement that is measurable that's implementable that will be implemented that you can then reward and, and that's 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 how you can have your ideal you you can have whatever ideal you want as long as you're willing to reduce your movement forward to achievable increments.